Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nala Lee and we'll be discussing word structure or morphology today. It's a topic that I broached in EL1101E, The Nature of Language, an introductory module to linguistics here at NUS. So I've chosen to talk about word structure today, not only because it's a rather fun one, but because I hope you begin to see for yourselves how different bits of language can be stacked together, stacked up and used systematically, very much like Lego building blocks. At the end of this class, you should walk away with the knowledge of what morphology is, what a morpheme is, and how this knowledge of morphology can be useful as a speaker of any language. So let's begin with this rather random picture of a hippo with its mouth open. Let's call him Sam. So this is Sam. He joins every day. You would say that Sam is a joiner. So most of you would agree with me that Sam is a joiner, even though you have never encountered the word John, and even though you know that John is a word that I made up for the purpose of this class. What this goes to show is that as speakers of English, we realize that S can be detached from John and that ER can be attached to John, and that as such, S and ER are both meaningful. We could take it a step further, and we might say that S is used to mark agreement with a third person, he, so he joins instead of they join, and that ER transforms a person or a thing into someone or something that carries out a particular action, in this case, the action of joining. So, even with no knowledge of linguistics, as speakers of the languages that we speak, we have some innate knowledge of word structure. What the John phenomenon goes to show is that a one-level structure is insufficient to account for word meaning. A two-level structure is required to fully account for word meaning, and such a study of word structure is what we call morphology. At the base of this particular structure that you see is the morpheme level. You can think of the morpheme as being the smallest meaningful unit in any language. Using that criteria, how many morphemes are there in these words? Lit, as in this party is very lit. Super. This lecture is super. Superhumans. Salamander. I'll give you a moment for this. So if you've said one, one, three and one, you're right. Lit cannot be further broken down and is therefore one morpheme. And while there's an ER in super, it does not contribute any meaning to super, nor does it combine with soup in any meaningful way. And super on its own is one morpheme. There are three morphemes in superhumans, super, human, and the plural s. Finally, while salamander is a longish word and we see er again, the er here does nothing to contribute to the combined meaning of salamander and is therefore not a real morpheme. Therefore, we can conclude that there's only one morpheme in salamander, even though it's almost as long as the word superhuman. So you might already have had some sense of this, that there are different types of morphemes. Free morphemes can stand in isolation, and examples of free morphemes that you have already encountered include lit, super, human, and salamander. On the contrary, bow morphemes cannot stand in isolation. Examples of bow morphemes are the third person singular s, the plural s, and er. We can refer to these types of bow morphemes as being affixes. Other types of bow morphemes do exist, but we aren't concerned with those today. Affixes, on their own, can also be classified according to where they are attached. Affixes that are attached at the beginning of a word are called prefixes. For example, when in goes in front of an adjective, a describing word such as conceivable and describable, it negates those qualities so that you get not conceivable and not describable. Another example is the prefix re, in the case of rethink, reorder, or even redo, to mean to do again, to think again, or to order again. Affixes that are attached at the end of the words are called suffixes, such as with the plural s in cats and dogs, or with ing at the end of puck and climb over here. And when ist is attached to the nouns, art and chem, we derive the words for the people who practice art and chemistry. There are also other types of cool, interesting bow morphemes that are not found in English. We've got infixes, and as the name suggests, infixes are attached to the inside of a word. In Indonesian, gembong means bloated, but when le is added, we derive gelembong, meaning bubble. In Toba Batak, another language spoken in Indonesia, dao means far, 
But when we add ung, we derive the word for further to mao. Then we have circumfixes. These are attached to the front and back of a word at the same time. In German, Sprecher means to speak, and gesprochen means to have spoken. And you don't actually have to look very far to find circumfixes. Circumfixes are also found in our local language, Malay. Banar, for example, means true. And when ke and an are added to the front and back of the word, we derive the word for truth or kebenaran. Now, having talked about several affixes and seen these ones a couple of times, are these the same affixes to you? Is S in Superman saves the day again, the same S as in the cows jumped over the moon? Is ER in the pasture is green on the other side, the same ER as in Clark Kent is a reporter when he's not being Superman? Well, not quite. The first instance of S here is the third person singular S, while the second instance of S here is the plural S. And when ER is attached to green, it makes it a comparative. As with, this shade of green is much greener than that shade of green. While ER and reporter makes Clark Kent a person who reports for a living. At the end of the day, these aren't quite the same affixes as each affix has its own unique meaning. FASFA, the English affixes that we've covered are affixes that we use regularly and with great ease with many different words. Not all affixes are as productive. Here, I have a list for you to think about. Isle, as in mobile and tactile. Lock, as in wet lock, pre and oboe. Which ones of these are productive and which ones of these are unproductive? You might want to try a fun test here. Could you use these affixes with Google or Instagram? I'll give you a moment here. You most likely could say it's hard to imagine what it was like living in the pre-Google era. You could almost likely say, this is such an Instagramable cafe, but you wouldn't be able to use our or lock in the same way. So Google Ao or Instagram lock would just be plain weird. And as such, we would be able to say that pre and herbal are productive, while our and lock are unproductive. We can also use our knowledge of morphology to differentiate between words that seem rather closely related. What is, for example, the difference between disgraceful and ungraceful? You can say, this was such a disgraceful waste of money and that the gait of the baby elephant was ungraceful. But you're not as likely to say that the gait of the baby elephant was disgraceful or that this was an ungraceful waste of money. Why is this so? It begins to make sense when you learn to appreciate these morphological trees. These words don't quite mean the same thing, even if they seem rather similar. In the first tree on the left, the word disgrace is formed first by prefixing dis onto grace before the suffix fo is utilized. And we derive a word that means full of disgrace, as in, this is such a disgraceful waste of money. In the second tree, the word graceful is formed first by suffixing fo onto grace before the prefix an is utilized. So that we derive a word meaning not graceful, as in, this baby elephant walks rather ungracefully. And as you can see, these words that look and feel rather similar have two distinct meanings, and our knowledge of morphological structure can actually highlight these otherwise subtle differences. In sum now, morphology is the study of word structure, and the morpheme is the smallest meaningful unit in any language. Meanings of words can also be derived from our systematic understanding of morphology. At this point, I'd like to leave you with a few questions for you to think about. Is straw in strawberry a morpheme? Why can you say unhappy but not dishappy? Are there two meanings to the word unfoldable? What about unforeseeable? Would you construct one or two trees with these ones? So with that, I hope you have enjoyed this class, that you have learned something that you thought was new and fun, and that I might see you sometime in the future at NUS. Thank you for your time.